Yo, 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 welcome to Quake 808. And today we have a very special guest on board. It's the guy who flips rhymes that rip through the chest cavity and he keeps on going and going like an energizer battery. And while you fall to the waistline when you waste rhymes, when he's got it flowing, when it comes to the fat beats and bass lines, he once said he's got crazy games so no one can stop me. But wait, he's white, so I guess his game is hockey. A rapper who puts aside spooks to leave a trace and sets them correct with the effect of the gas face. We've got the Forest Gump of hip hop. We've got him on board. MC Search is in the house. How are you doing, man? That's got to be the most impressive uh, intro I've ever heard, man. And I fucked that up. And I, <laughs> I know there's going to be people out there who already know that I don't t- tend to fuck these up. And of course, I do it when there's a legend on. But man, I appreciate that. I mean, that that was that was impressive. That that was a lot of lyrics from. <laughs> Several different records. Man. Uh, that was good. That was good. Thank you, man. Thank you. Uh, I just had to because I know uh, those gems you dropped all that time back still resonate, bro. So oh, <laughs> still you. resonate. Thank you. Um, I'm glad it resonates with someone because <laughs> damn sure doesn't resonate with my kids. My kids, uh, <laughs> I don't care. Don't worry. They'll come round. They'll come round. Eventually, right? That's what I hear. I understand that eventually your kids come around. Right now, you know, my kids are on... T- between video gaming and Japanese anime and mm. uh, alt rock and Damn. a bunch of other things. So uh, eventually. We're, we're all learning in that house then, right? Alt rock, yes. anime, love it. Uh, search, man. So you're on for the pod for the first time and we ask every guest the same question when they come on. Um, what's the least hip hop thing you've done in the last 24 hours, my friend? <laughs> <laughs> that's great that's great uh the least hip-hop thing uh okay well i i define hip-hop as peace unity love and having fun mm. uh, those are kind of the tenets of of hip-hop um yeah you know and then you have you know graffiti break dancing djing mc and doing the knowledge mm. so i would think the least hip-hop thing i've done is uh is probably take my card this morning to get it tuned up. That's good. Uh, although, uh, yeah, because there's no peace, there's no unity, there's no love, and there's no yeah. having fun yeah. in any of that. <laughs> it's all uh, chaos and trauma and <laughs> nerves and uh, hoping that uh, they're not going to break the bank with what they tell you they have to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's probably the least hip-hop. Although when I get to the dealership Mm. there's a lot of hip-hop going around because a lot of the service guys are old graffiti artists break dancers (laughs) so there's a lot of uh, a lot of this going on where they're like yeah yo remember when you said this rhyme like what were you thinking about when you said this rhyme so there's a lot of that right Uh, shout out to my man mr dave big up big dave in the parts department Mm -hmm. uh who will uh ask he'll say uh Mr. B, he calls me Mr. B. So, Mr. B, let me ask you a question about that lyric. Uh, I'm like, okay, okay, Big Dave. So that's probably the least hip-hop thing I've done. Yeah. Everything else after that has been incredibly hip-hop. Uh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Th- that That's probably the best answer I've ever had. <laughs> we have laundry. You well, broke listen, it down. You gave me the best intro, so I had to counter. With the best answer. Wimbledon, I had to have a strong volley. <laughs> You know, with Wimbledon oh, going on, I, I have it. to have a strong volley. I love it. And I love the London reference. It's all working right now. I love this. The energy is good. I love this. Uh, I love London. And let me tell you, I love one of my, the most favorite places for mm. me to go on tour was London. Yes. I loved London. They always treated me so well. Mm. Um, I recently found out a friend of mine, uh, Mr. Shel Visage, who's on uh, RuPaul's Drag Race. Mm-hmm. Um, moved to London like seven years ago. Oh. And uh, I became extremely jealous of that whole <laughs> idea. Oh, right. Um, I'm like, man, I wish I could afford to live in London. But, uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I moved it's, out of London because I couldn't afford to live in London. I yeah, still work I, I, there, but yeah. Right. But uh, I I just, I they've always treated me so well. And I think there's a part of my wife's philosophy Mm. because we talked about it at some point, like just packing up and just living six months in different places. Yeah. Kind of 
going out in the sunset and living six months here. I don't think she wants me in London because I think she believes, and I and I do believe this. I think mm. that if people found out I lived in London, there'd be a lot of people asking me to do shows. Right. And my wife will tell you on more than one occasion uh, that she's not being trying to be married to MC Search anymore. <laughs> like, if I want to go on tour, that I should probably, yeah. you know, amicably divorce and uh, <laughs> and be married to uh the uh the touring game oh my god um, what, yeah, what, yeah, what a decision so. well actually yeah. you know you're talking about london i had a few things lined up and i just wanted to pick up my man lee can right for showing me this but i don't know if you remember this right cookie crew born this way of course, of course. in the video nice yeah. cameo Hats from mc fate. search yeah goose <laughs> goose full length but full length goose with Loved the fur it. collar <laughs> i got a call it's so crazy that video too because I think Fat Five Freddy was the director. Yes. Pretty sure he was the director. Mm. Anyway, I'm in, I was at the Lion Quarter. Mm. And I was on my way home and he's like, yo, I'm shooting a video of town. Mm. It didn't matter who the video was for. Yeah. If I'm going to, I just want to be in a video and it's uptown in Harlem. I was probably heading that way anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, the rooftop was, you know, the, the rotation was you go to Latin Quarter. Mm. And when you leave the quarter, then you'd go uptown to like the rooftop on 155th. Mm. So he was shooting this video. I'm like, oh, I'm going to go. And they're like, it's the cookie crew. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Who? I don't know these chicks. Yeah. But they were British and it was cool. And everybody, we knew everybody. Mm. So it was basically the IOU dances, the ICU dances. It was like all of our people from the quarter. Yeah. They're like, fuck it. We're just going to take over this video. We're just going to take over the video. <laughs> Every dance move was basically our, our routines from the quarter. Mm. And then he basically said, all right, at the end of the video, we're all going to come out. Yeah. And we all want you to do a signature move. And I'm like, fuck it. I'm just going to go out and do the bobblehead. And I was yeah. like. <laughs> and it was, I had a blast. I had yeah. my bubble goo. But I, the one thing I remember about the video, because the video then was on Video Music Box, because that was mm. the first time I saw it. I didn't see it on MTV. Mm. All my homeboys were like, yo, that's so fresh. You had that fresh coat on. I'm like, wait a minute. The moves weren't fresh. <laughs> the bobblehead wasn't fresh. The hot top fade wasn't fresh. No, the bo the, no none of that. It was the, the, the full length, triple goose. Full length. <laughs> it was sick, Goose though. with the fur collar. Yeah, it was sick. I've I've, I've been known for some dope for full length coats. Brooklyn mm. Queens. People still ask me about that shearling. Yes. The shearling that I wore in Brooklyn Queens. People still ask me if I had that. I wish I did. Yeah. <laughs> um, I love that shearling. Um, the white my the shearling my wife wore in that. Well, she was my girlfriend at the time. Mm -mm -mm. But the shearling my wife wore the petal black shearling that I yeah. had. Custom made for her for that video on Delancey Street. I wish she should have still had that. I don't know what we did with those. Damn. Damn. Those were fresh. You, yeah, they were fresh, man. They were. But then again, right, I'm seeing videos like that. I've seen the other interviews you've done where you're just telling incredible stories. And you truly are the Forrest Gump of it. It's like he's there again. He's just there again. I had a conversation with um, Dale the Funky Homo Sapien last week or a few weeks ago. And uh, he said to me, you're popping up in them conversations, my bro. Like, he's like, oh, by the way, big up MC search. I was like, oh, wow, wicked. Okay. So your, your history, you're intertwined in the tapestry. Yeah. I think. <laughs> I, I love Dell. I, I just, I've, well, I was always a fan of his, uh, and, uh, and Hyro. And I just, I mm. think, I just think the world of those guys. Yeah. Do you remember when you first saw them guys, they must've brought that different energy to, to East or did you see them on the West? Maybe. No, I saw it on the West. I was in, uh, I was in the Bay Area, mm. 92, 93. Mm. Uh, I was going to see Tech and Sway uh, when they were in K at KML in San Francisco. Mm. And uh, I had heard Dell's record because Dell was signed to Electra, same time that KMD was signed. Yes. So I, I knew his Mr. Dabalina record. I knew yeah, that, yeah. you know, those guys were um, getting ready to drop their record. And then I heard uh, the the Hyro record, mm. 93 to infinity. And the reason I heard the record, funny enough, is because the guy who ran Jive Records was a guy named Barry Weiss. Right. 
And Barry said to me, he goes, you know, Search, if you ever decide to stop rapping, I want you to come to Jive and work as a promotion guy, mm. to radio promotion. Um, and uh, I had heard, you know, Tech and Sway had played the record. And, you know, it's just one of those things that as soon as you hear it, you're like, oh, that's a smash. Mm. Like, you're like, that's that's a fucking smash. It's like, you know, Helen yeah. Keller can see in here that that shit's a smash. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, um, and uh, just an amazing, it was just an amazing record mm. vibe, you know, just their flow is so different. Yeah. Um, it was just such a great combination of, and Dell too, like they had this thing, Dell, Casual, mm. Hyro. They had this wordplay that was very East Coast, but they had this very smooth, laid back yeah. Bay Area shit that was just, it was just such a cool melt. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, them, the far side, there was just this vibe of those records from the West Coast that took the best of the wordplay from De La, Native Tongues, mm. uh, and kind of melded it with, you know, some real fat back funk from the Bay. Yeah, man. A perfect way to put it. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was going to move on. Actually, before we move on from London vibes, I have to actually ask you, can you tell me about the time the Queen got the gas face? Because <laughs> yeah. I've heard the story. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, so, so, um, the, um, yeah, we were, we were in the, First time or second time I was in London. Mm. Second time. Second time I was in London. Mm. Um, Gas Face was like, it was just a big record. We mm. were there touring with Public Enemy. So we were splitting up our time between doing shows with Public Enemy and De La Soul. Right, right. Uh, and De La Soul were just like, you know, they were the biggest pop act in London at the time. Mm. And, you know, our record Gas Face was doing really well. Um, and we had gone into Brixton and when I went to Brixton, there were all these like, I mean, it looked like a movie set. I'll, I'll never forget it. There was like, you know, barrels, trash barrels on fire. Hmm. Uh, there was this ghostbuster, you know, the, there was this word, the poll tax with the ghostbuster thing. Yeah. Yeah. No poll tax, no poll tax. And, you know, I was, learning you know through the london times and listening to the bbc you know what the part what parliament was trying to pass which was this tax that was a 2500 pound tax for every person that lived under a roof mm. household. and for a blue collar family that might make sense you know if mm. you're a 2.2 family you know yeah mother you know but in Brixton and in the neighborhoods where they were high Caribbean, high black and brown people, that's not how they lived in a household. You'd had 10, 12, 14 people mm. that lived under one roof. And if the average income was 30 to 35 pounds a year, how are you expected to make a $25,000 payment? Yeah. To the... And there was just civil unrest. Uh, not only between parliament and why they were trying to pass the poll tax, but you know, what was going on in the street. Mm. And uh, we're doing a show at, uh, at Brixton Academy. Big. And um, it was weird because we're, we're doing the show at Brixton and we're touring with public enemy. Right. And I look at the, yeah, I used to love to go and see, you know, the lineup, you know, who's, you know. Yeah, yeah. So my shit was like, I, and I love to see who the London groups were because Chuck was great for that. He'd always have like the, the hottest, whatever. Yeah. So it was like Silver Bullet did a lot of shows with us. Big. Uh, MC Duke did a lot of shows with yes. us. Yes. 20 seconds, you know, 20 seconds to comply was the fucking shit. <laughs> 30 seconds, sorry, 30 seconds to comply. Yeah. That record was the fucking shit. Mm. Um, and, uh, and then we met DJ DJ uh, Richie Rich, oh, right, who yeah. you know had beef with our DJ Richie Rich. <laughs> right. uh, anyway, so you know, and, and and you know, we're doing all the radio stuff and all that. And I look at the lineup, and and there's the lineup, and it's you know, 
whoever's on the show with us, whether it was Silver Bullet and this mm. one and that one, and then it's De La, and then it says Public Enemy in third base. Yeah. And I said, that's got to be a mistake. Like, why we're, we're not, he's like, and Chuck always said, you got the hottest record in the street, you close. Like, you're the one who closed. Right. And I was scared to death because, you know, Public Enemy is Public Enemy. I mean, they got the mm. S1Ws, they got <laughs> Flavor, they got, I mean, yeah. Terminator X, they got the show. They, I mean, it was just amazing. Yeah. You know, and we're just this band who's got like maybe two records and an album that just dropped. And, yeah, you know, they're already into like their second album. And, you know. Man. Um, That's big of never Chuck. Forget, That's yeah, so I mean, big of Chuck. Yeah, I mean, but, that was, but Chuck was like that around the world. Like it didn't matter if it was London or Louisiana. If you were hot, you closed. Right. Like that was it. Okay. You know? Yo, 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 just interrupting this episode to give you a quick update on our plans for 2021. But before I do, just remember to subscribe on YouTube and like this video. Also, get involved in the comments. We always have some dope takes on there. So shout out to people that are getting involved. We love reading them. And hopefully some more of you guys can get on there and we'll shout you out on the episodes coming up. Now, on to 2021. We here at Crate 808 are setting up a Patreon where for the price of a pint or a coffee every month, we'll be bringing you even more dope hip-hop episodes. Simply go to crate808.com, subscribe to the newsletter, you'll get all the updates on our plans. But as a taster, each month we're thinking of bringing you 90s rap hidden gem album reviews that you can vote for. So if you enjoy people like Master Ace, Diamond D, The Lynch Mob, Paris, Big Noid, Blase Blase, we'll be doing a lot more of those. We're going to do our Why I Love series, the MF Doom and Jay Diller editions. Each month we'll bring on a guest and dig into why they love a certain Doom or JD track and then test that love. How deep is that love? So expect some nostalgia right there. Next up, Wu-Tang Chronicles, Ghostface Killer Edition. We're aiming here, I don't know if it's going to be good or bad, but we're aiming to go through every solo Wu project, and we're going to start with Ghostface Catalog. So we're going to go in, we're going to talk about the music, we're going to talk about the fashion sense, and just some of the amazing bars he's dropped in that career. So you can expect that as well. And then for every patron who comes on, get your name on the credits, the Crate 808 credits, and in our Hall of Fame. So that'll be, you know, I don't know how that's going to look right now, but we're going to give each of you a little bit of shine and a shout out on the show. And uh, the Griselda Marathon, I want to do it, I want to do it. If we get enough patrons, we're going to do it. We're going to go through every single Griselda project and really let's dive in, yeah? So get involved. Hit up Crate808.com, subscribe to the newsletter, as well as the YouTube and the podcast. Now, back to the episode. So as you know, Brixton's is, you know, I think one of the oldest theaters in all of London. It's got to like, be. Got to be up there. Shakespeare fucking did shows there. Or some <laughs> shit. And it was like, I remember it was like dirt floors. I, I just remember it was just really an old rickety building. Yeah. And the base made the walls shake. And, you know, I just remember it being really dark and dense. Yeah. And the towers on left and the right hand side had to be 30 feet high. Yeah. Like easily 30 feet. Yeah. And Flavor is climbing to the top of the tower on on stage left. Right. Doing the Flavor dance <laughs> to 911 as a joke, which is 119 as a joke, right? Because that's... It's 999. 911 is not emergency. It's like 119. It's 999 here. I'm sorry? 999. Oh, 999. Yeah. 999, right. So 999 is a joke. So he changed it. So he's doing 99 and he's doing a da- Flavor dance. <laughs> On these fucking, and they're like this, and I'm like, oh my god, he's gonna kill it! Like, and he doesn't give a fuck. He's dancing, right. and I'm, and I'm. This is incredible. And we get on stage, and uh, we're doing our thing, and we're gonna, and we're gonna close the show with gas. Big. And uh, and you know, crowd was cool with Step Today, and crowd was cool with Brooklyn Queens. Crowd was cool with our. Yeah, album cuts. There were people that knew him, people you know that didn't. We were a new band. Mm-hmm. Daddy Rich does his tricks. Crowd goes crazy, mm. you know. Um, and then we go into Gas Face, and people are just starting to lose their shit. And then it's like, thanks, Search, and everybody, yeah, MC Search. And I just said, cut the music. Oh, cut the music. And then as loud as I could, like, I, and I don't know why I felt like the, I needed to scream this, but I was just, I really didn't understand my voice and I didn't, I just, just 
I said, cut the music. I got something to say. I got something to say. And I just start screaming, black cat is bad luck. Bad guys wear black. Must have been the same queen that set up the poll tax. Get the gas. And the beat came in. Oh. Bah, bah, bah. <laughs> the crowd <laughs> went, I mean, the horns. But then everybody starts running into the street. What? Like, and I'm, and we're performing. And the crowd, and, and I mean, they're just like losing. The audience lost their mind. Mm. And pow, 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 pow. <laughs> and I'm and I'm and I I don't even think I think that I was probably my lyrics were incoherent because I'm just screaming mm -hmm. to the point that I lost my voice. Yeah. Um, which I did often. I would just scream my lyrics until I was hoarse. Yeah. Um and then, you know, Zev Love X, May You Rest in Peace, MF Doom came out. And, and the crowd is damn near half empty at this point. That's crazy. And they're in the streets. And we're being told by our tour manager that they are just full blast riding. In oh, my God. They're full blast riding. Fuck the, fuck the queen. Fuck the poll tax. Shit. Poll tax, get the gas face. And we're coming around the corner in our tour bus. And they're already, you know, the poll tax gets the gas face. We're seeing... You know, mm. and I learned that, like, you know, like I'm just again, I'm learning all this. And the next day, I don't, and I, I'd love to see the paper, mm. but the next day we're leaving town, and in one of the newspapers, mm. it says third base gives the queen the gas face. <laughs> oh my! And days. I don't know if it was like the main. I don't know if it was the cover yeah. or whatever it was, but in, in the in maybe it was the review of the show. But mm. whatever it was, it was third base gives the queen the gas face. Beautiful. And we then toured, we toured all the way around Europe. Four months later, five months later, we come back mm. and we're doing Wembley with Public Enemy. Oh, my days. And it's, you know, it's 140,000 people. It's sold out. And it's De La, it's Public Enemy, it's us. It's, it's just crazy. Mm. and public enemy is closing for sure mm. and i'll never forget at this but you know when they they said mc search even before i could say black hat is bad the whole crowd is black hat is bad luck <laughs> bad guys wear black must have been the same queen that set up the poll tax whoa get the gas face and i mean it's just wow. i've never seen obviously i never experienced a crowd that size in my life mm. um but for them to just like not only take my lyrics but then you know create a you know a political remix yeah uh, so that was just it just it was an, an amazing moment uh, Man. in my life so yeah Jeez. it was crazy it's crazy. That, so. I love that. I love that, man. You're truly on the pulse. But you know what? Like, just for people who may not have, uh, like, checked this out, but, like, Search says your podcast, all the other stuff you've done, and, like, I think there's, as you tell that story to me, it, te it reminds me, hip-hop has this beating heart underneath it that's, like, really old and has seen so much. And nowadays, your kids, my kids, whoever, youngsters are listening to hip hop. It's not the same. But on that same tip, I just wanted to say, you mentioned Zeb Lovex, Daniel Dumoulin. Ironically, we're speaking on his 50th birthday today. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking about them a lot. I'm pretty sure you probably have. Uh, before we get into Daniel Dumoulin and that whole you know, amazing chronicles of his life, I just want to say thank you, man, because when he passed away as a massive fan, I went to Clubhouse on the rooms. I was like, um, listen to, I was taking everything in. And I remember hearing your uh, podcast, Search Says, with Quest Love. And I just want to say thank you for sharing that emotion, bro, because that tribute episode just reminded me there's a heart, there's a soul to all this music, to all this fashion. There's a heart to it. And you brought that, you both did in that episode. And yeah, I just want to say thank you for that, man. For sure. Yeah, we're working actually uh, with his widow Jasmine now on, you know, we did a, a podcast called Did I Ever Tell You the One About podcast. Mm. Um, season one was Did I Ever Tell You the One About Big Daddy Kane. Yeah. Uh, which was amazing. And Kane was just super gracious, not only with his time, but telling stories he never told anywhere else about how his father came to, you know, from the Carolinas to Brooklyn and how. Mm. The Juice Crew became the, you know, season two, 
is working with Jasmine is, did I ever tell you the one about MF Doom? No way. And it's the entire story and the arc of his life. Because I've shared this, you know, um, now a couple of times. You know, I know Daniel Dumoulin. I know Zev Lavex. I know mm. Subrock. I know GYP. I know KMD. Mm. I don't know The Mask. You know, I don't know yeah, Doom. Yeah. Mm. Um, and after Subrock died, you know, he and I, you know, went our separate ways. Mm. Um, and there was a part of it that is because I was married and I was focused on family and I was in yeah. a different headspace. And a lot of it was because he was very much in pain and very much, you know, insulated. And he was rolling with people that I knew, but I didn't want to be around. And, mm. you know, it was just a different time. But it's funny because it was always something that in the back of my mind, I knew that I would eventually be able to make amends and mm. kind of speak to him about it and communicate with him about, you know, where things went left. Uh, and, you know, I was in Clubhouse when, you know, Young Guru uh, shared the news, mm. you know, that, you know, Just Plays had put it up on his post. Mm. And, uh, you know, it was really uh, one of those things that was like a, um, it was a, it was a, a gut punch, mm. you know. Um, but the beautiful part about doing this podcast and putting it together um, is that there's so many amazing stories yeah, from the people that love him and knew him, um, as well as, you know, fans who were impacted by him. You know, mm. one of the things that I found out in doing this podcast is that there were uh, not only murals in London and murals in France on, you know, walls around the world that were mm. tributes. There's, in Wynwood, there's a beautiful mural to him but guys were tagging on trains yeah you know uh in france in amsterdam yeah. and what i understood is that especially in japan they don't allow bomb trains to leave the stations anymore like it's not something that you would see right um in doom's case japan let one run for 72 hours Amsterdam let one run for two days. France let one run for three days. Amazing. Because the people that are in charge of the Transit Association grew up on Doom. Amazing. You know what I'm saying? So they knew what the impact was. Mm. And they had the ability to talk to the government and say, this is not graffiti. This is a tribute. This is a mural and a tribute. Mm. Um, and it, it's just, you know, it's those kind of stories uh, that when you hear them, it's, it, it really uh, puts an exclamation point on the impact that he had mm. on culture. Man, you know, yeah. huge. I didn't, even, yeah. as even as a head, I didn't even think of that man. I didn't even think that he was in the, you know, it, but obviously he is. It's art. It's he, for me. He's the greatest. I know Rakim is like in my five all day long. But there's something about Doom in my particular time in my life. He's my number one now. I feel. But I wanted right. to ask you really about like because you you had him in your videos. You had KMD. You had Subrock. Question the third base subrock so did that in the hair so the original one that i used to rock all the time mm -hmm. was the good as i like to lovingly refer to it as the good one <laughs> was the one that subrock would did right the one that's on the album cover and was on the the promo covers that was done at astor place right that is not a good one <laughs> that, that was not the pot like and it bothers the shit out of me all the time yeah because astor place would have the thing like oh this is where mc search got his and i'm like no motherfucker like this was just is it i got told by the label like oh yeah. we're shooting your cover today yeah yeah my hair was busted i couldn't get out all the way to long beach yeah to have doom do it properly mm. you know so i had to go to astor place and get like a whack one version oh done. man who That's even thought I, yeah, of that got it done. who even yeah. thought of the idea though was it you was it them no it was sub rock i mean so i had like so when i was hanging around with those guys so i'm like 18 i you know so Doom and they were like four and five years younger than me. Mm. 
Oh, wow. So when I was like 19, so I was like, I started hanging out with those guys. We all started hanging out when I was like 18, 19. Mm. So they were like 15, 14. They were like my boys. Mm. Um, so I'm about 19. I got a Jufro, you know, I got an Afro. Yeah. Uh, kinky, you know, you know, Ashkenazi, you know, <laughs> Jewish hair. Mm -hmm. And out of nowhere, Subrock, he was like 14. He's like, yo, you should, why don't you cut that into a high top fade? And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, you should cut that into a high top fade. Yeah. And he was always nice with the clippers. Like he was always, so I was like, all right, if you want to do it, do it. Mm. And he did. And the thing is that, you know, I didn't need any hairspray. I didn't need any like, yeah. hair, like that my hair was like that. Yeah, yeah. And I remember the second that he cut it, I like shot a move to New to the city. Right. Because I was going to now test it. Like I was going to test it in the street. Mm. And uh, I remember going to 96th Street and Broadway where, you know, Bobito's house was and, mm -hmm. you know, where Saik, my man Saik lived and yeah. um, to show it. And they were like, oh, that's fresh. That's crazy. And we were on our way to like go hang out somewhere. And a girl walked by me, dark skinned girl. Mm. She walked by me and then she came back and she tapped me on the shoulder and she said, are you light skinned? Yeah. I was like, no, nah, I'm white. She's like, how? I said, oh, that's my hair. That's just like how my hair grows. And she said, can I touch it? I was like, can I touch your hair? <laughs> Black woman? We ain't allowed to touch your hair. Why do you think you can touch my hair? Woman? She started laughing. I was like, no, nah, you can touch it. And she was like, oh my God, it's so kinky. Wow. So yeah. So, wow. My, and so, so then Subrock started cutting my hair mm. and then he started like messing with like designs. Yeah. And then when we finally called the, the name of the group third base and we showed him the logo, he cut it in the back of my head. Amazing. And that's kind of how we, you know, and he got like so nice. Like he started doing shadowing in the edge. Like he's just, Jeez. he was, I mean, he was so nice with his, his yeah. skills. So when I, when we did the, 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 Peach was video. Yeah, yeah. I was like, yo, you got to cut the KMD logo on the back of my head. You got to yeah. do that. Yeah. I was like, yo, you got to do that. And yeah. uh, he was like, yeah. I'm, so, but then uh, it, it was, yeah. So it was just a lot. We had a lot of fun and it was just yeah. really good days and mm. hanging out with GYP and, you know, going to Roosevelt Field Mall and just, it just, those were like, those were the days. Wicked, man. Because I even hear stories of you, KMD, and pack like in the same room and stuff is this real? well i mean we were i mean we weren't we were all on tour together during right. you know the big daddy Kane taste the chocolate tour yeah so it was you know digital underground queen latifah mm. you know third base um who else was on that tour third base nice and smooth mm. um oh wow hell of a tour and digital and digital underground oh damn. And, and digital underground Pac would be on the road with Digital Underground mm. as a dancer. Mm. So, you know, we would, and Shock G, may he rest in peace. So what we would usually do at the end of every night when we were on the road is Shock would find a piano. Wow. Like that was Shock's, Shock's shit is he'd find a piano. Mm. And then we would shower and throw our stuff on the bus. And then we would meet shock around the piano and it would usually be me Pac, sometimes doom sometimes money b mm. um or all of us and we would just run off the top of our heads what? about how much we loved each other and how much you know how important this time was and mm. every once in a while there would be some mc who would try to want it and mm -hmm. We would slay them and then they would leave. <laughs> and, um, you know, it wouldn't be a lot of people. There was very few times there would be a lot of people around that piano because they didn't mm. want to, like, hang with us. We were like nerds. Like, we were just like hip-hop nerds rhyming. What's a um, Doom and Pack and you and Shock G and Sub Rock are around a piano all rhyming about how much you love each other and anyone who comes to battle, one of you is going to slay them. Is this a comic book? It feels like, <laughs> it feels like a graphic novel. This needs it's to be not, told. It's really not. It's really <laughs> not. It's, you know, it was one of those things, man, where we were just like, we were just very much about enjoying the moment, being mm. in the moment. Yeah. You know, and with Doom 
and with Subrock and me and Pac and Shock G, it was really just about music. It was about yeah. hip hop. And uh, man, it was just so much fun. Like it was just yeah. so much fun to just rhyme and not worried about anything. Yeah. You know, and, and Kane was doing his thing and Latifah was doing her thing and mm. Moni was doing her thing. And, you know, and, and we were all a family. It was just like all a family. Yeah. Um, you know, and then Pac started um, with Digital Underground doing water gun fights. Mm. And they would print out flyers <laughs> and be like, it's on water gun fight tonight. You know, wow. don't walk. And we you have to go get super soakers and like, you know, and that became a whole thing. Yeah. You know, so it just really, it was just, we were just a bunch of, oh, and MC Light was on tour. So okay. it was just a bunch of us having fun. Yeah. Like it was just about, and, you know, that was a big part of the fun, which was, you know, if there was a piano, we were all going to rhyme and freestyle and, you mm. know, just talk about whatever we were talking about. Yeah. The things that I remember the most was just talking about how much we loved each other. That's amazing, man. That's so beautiful. Man, my heart is full right now, man, for sure. Uh, it's interesting because you you have a battling pedigree, I've heard, you know, and obviously you have the rhymes to back it up. But just out of interest, hardest battles you may have done or been in back in the day, do you remember some – or do you remember just absolutely destroying people? Any memorable ones? Yeah, I mean, I, I remember – I mean, the one battle that I remember I had the most challenge with hmm. was the one time that I actually tried to write a rhyme in preparation for a battle. Oh. Um, and it was during the battle for world supremacy in 1987. Right. Um, there was a MC in a crew called the Mighty... Dismasters. Right. And the guy who was in the crew is and in the battle was a guy named Raven T. Okay. And Raven T was battling people with one liners, like, you know, your mama's so fat, and you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and he was killing everybody. And I tried my best to write my own set of, you know, mm. you know, um one liners. Mm. And I said, you know, Raven T, I'm going to put this whole thing to a dead stop. You got so much hair under your arms, it looked like butt beats in a headlock. <laughs> that, that's good. And then I said, and then I said something else. And then I fumbled because I, when I battle people, I never wrote. Mm. And the crowd started to boom me. Oh. And I looked over to him and he was unraveling a piece of paper to look at his rhymes and I honed in Oh, and I, I was able lucky enough to catch myself. Yeah. And I was like, wait a minute, you're going to battle me with a rhyme that you wrote on a piece of paper. Hold up. Where's the water? In fact, where's the waiter? I need somebody <laughs> to serve him a plate of rhymes that I'm about to equate <laughs> from the mental bang this motherfucker off this stage with no instrumental. My tempo is fucking fried. And then, and then I'm watching the clock on, and I said, yo, I said, you're about to get sun. Three, two, one, my job's done. And then, er, and the crowd went, oh! <laughs> you know, and I just, I just remember, and that I remember because I've seen the video like a hundred times. Right. Um, so that was one battle where I was like, oh, that got close. Mm. The other thing that was just funny about that battle, I got to the semifinals. And I was battling a dude named Bango, MC mm. Bango. And he was part of the Rhyme Syndicate posse. Right. So it was, you know, Jorge Hinojosa, Ice T, Africa Islam. Mm. And they're all in the front row. And this, you want to talk about a perfect setup yeah. for an MC. He's from Cleveland. Mm -hmm. His name is MC Bango. Right. And he's got the New York skyline cut in the back of his head. Right. Now, for a battle MC like me off the top of my head, I'm about to fucking bake this kid at 450 for about 45 minutes, flip him over, and let him simmer saute all day at 375, right? <laughs> and he comes over to me, and he says, yo, let's not diss each other. Right. And I'm like, 
uh, and he played <laughs> to my heartstrings, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He said, let's not diss each other. Mm. And I don't like confrontation. Like one of the things about me as a young man mm. is I don't like confrontation. Mm. I don't mind battling if it just happens naturally, mm. but I don't like confrontation. I certainly don't want confrontation with someone if I say no or whatever I would say in the heat of the moment, like, mm. you know, cause yeah. I already had it in my head. <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I already got every line, like every, even to this day, I remember like, you said you're from Cleveland, New York in your fucking head, no money, when you leaving? I got planes ready to take off from flight that look like they're on fucking plane in the back of your head overnight. Like I, I mean, I just had the whole shit. I mean, oh, I still remember days. like how I was gonna fucking roast this kid. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, he came, he went first and he did a, I don't even remember the rhyme what? because he rhymed at a hundred miles an hour. Oh. And he just said, I just remember him saying at the end of it, free South Africa. I can't believe I remember this shit like 30, 40 <laughs> you years go, later, you free South up. Africa. But the thing that was so dope about the battle for world supremacy is they had those really cool, like, you know, uh, brackets. Mm-hmm. So oh. I'm down to the final four bracket. Right. And uh, so I take my name off the bracket with the Velcro and uh, start to be, and I said, my name is Search. Like I'm looking for unity, black, white, it's all right. I want to see a community. Hip hop is about togetherness and we'll be together as long as we fight together uh, against oppression, apartheid. We need to fight this shit forever. Mm. Ah. Mm. Anyway. So we back and forth two verses mm. and the and the judges were red alert um the uh the uh educated rapper from utfo somebody else why i think it was marley Maul and somebody else and and red alert gets up and he goes we can't decide it's for us it's a tie we need the audience to decide what okay so they're like who's for bango and now, mind you, all the ROM syndicate dudes are in the front. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they're screaming bango, right? Mm. And they said, who's for search? And it sounds loud. Mm. They're like, nah, we can't figure it out. How many for bango? And again, yeah. and it sounds really loud on stage. Like yeah. even I thought I lost. Mm, mm. How many for search? Crowd goes crazy. Mm. The second they announced bango won, the whole crowd starts going, bullshit, <laughs> bullshit, bullshit, right? But it was what it was. Right. But when I walked off the stage, mm. there's Russell Simmons, and he says, look, when you leave this stage, if anybody asks you, mm. tell them you're signed to Def Jam. And that's how I got my deal. That's oh. how I ultimately how third base got signed. Oh, my days. I did not <clears throat> Wow. Yeah. I did not know that. That's amazing. Yeah. Man. Yeah. What a but story. That was like the, you know, but I would, be, I mean, I, I, dude, there was so many battles. I had so many battles. I, I, you know, that's how I cut my teeth. And it yeah. was also, you know, at the time, people didn't rhyme off the top of their head. Yeah. It was an unusual phenomenon. Mm. And that's all I did was rhyme off the top of my head. That's all I ever did. Yeah. Was I mean, I wrote, don't get me wrong, but in a battle, mm. I figured like you got to be able to be flexible and nimble. And yeah. how am I going to be flexible and nimble if I'm writing about a ghost? Mm. Exactly. And most people just wrote about shit they knew. I wanted to write about shit I saw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. No, definitely. Man, what story, man. Uh well, search, man. Obviously, there's there's more and more history we need to get into with you. Nas, pff, everyone talks to you about Nas. I just want to know, really, Nas, Ilmatic, what were your first impressions of Nas? Like when you first saw him, what was he like to you as a young man? How how did that how did he come across to you? I mean, the first time I heard Nas, I never even saw him. The first time I heard him was on Main Source's 1991 classic album mm. Breaking Adams, live at the barbecue. Mm. And that verse to me is still one of the greatest verses in the history of the culture. Mm. Um, So there was no doubt in my mind that whenever this young gentleman decided to put out something, it was going to be something that everyone checked for. Mm. 
Mm. There was no way in a zillion years you were going to tell me that I was going to be involved with not only Illmatic, but it was written. Like yeah. there's just, there was no, I mean, there was zero chance that that was going to happen. Mm. There was just none. Yeah. Um, so obviously not only hearing him, but then hearing him on my own record on back to the grill again. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just one of those things. It's like, wow. Like, yeah. And, wow. And that, what a amazing pleasure. Was he quite shy? He always seemed like, I don't know. I don't know if he was shy, but more reserved. No, I, I wouldn't say he was shy, but he was he was reserved and quiet. Like mm. he was not um he was young. I mean, he's 17 mm. years old. Like, you know, he was a young man. Yeah. Who um was extremely bright. Yeah. You know, 17 years old, knowing that he's getting offered a deal that he didn't feel good about. Yeah. Didn't make sense to him. Mm. You know, and he wanted someone to take a look at it that he felt would treat him fairly. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so it's more mature than I was. Yeah. Because when I got offered, Tony D offered me a deal. I signed it. I didn't even have a lawyer look it over. Yeah. I just signed it, you know. So mm. um, I just remember being really, really impressed with him as a, as a young man. Mm. Did you, because obviously then on, Searchlight, I think we all kind of know the story of that. And it was more the Illmatic sessions, I was wondering. And really, for yourself being so on hands on with that and with working in that kind of amazing creative space, when did for you, did you realize, oh my God, this is a classic? This is actually a classic. Do you remember when that? So, yeah. So, you know, it's funny. I didn't go to any, I went to one session once and it was only out of a, just a pure mistake. Oh, right. Okay. Having to be in the city. My, my main job was to stay out of Nas's way. Mm -hmm. So like if Nas needed a ride to Yonkers to go to Pete Rock's house to, you know, I would do that every day mm. for months. I would drive him from, Yon you know, from Queensbridge to Yonkers to get to Pete Rock's house yeah. to listen to beats. Or I'd take him from Long Island to, you know, large professor's house, you know, mm. my job was to really make sure that the producers who produced the album and the samples that were cleared, um, that all the legal was done. I wanted to right. make sure that he had no problems, that there was all of the legal matters. That's how I saw myself playing the role as ex an executive producer. Yeah. That I needed to make sure that the line budget was right, that we didn't go over budget, that we were just doing exactly what we needed to do to deliver mm. this album. Okay. Um, when I heard the final, because he wouldn't even let me go to mastering, like Nas, when he when he went in with uh, Tony Dawsey, mm. uh, I couldn't even go. I couldn't even listen. Faith Newman called me and she was like, have you heard the album yet? I said, well, I, I know every song. She goes, no, 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 no you need to come to the mastering studio. And, and she played me the acetate, mm. uh, which is, you know, how they press the vinyl mm. of the album. And I'm like, wow, like, are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. Like, are you fucking kidding me? Um, I mean, I still get goosebumps when I listen to Illmatic. Mm -hmm. I listen to Illmatic at least once a day, Damn. still. Damn. Um, and I still get goosebumps. Um, I listened to it was written um, at least a couple of times a week. Right. Um, you know, um, and again, you know, the philosophy there was I wanted Nas to not have to go through what every other artist went through before him. Mm. I wanted him to be an artist who was profitable, mm. who was being able to be treated professionally and be prolific yeah, and give him the ability to do what he said to me when he first met me, which was get his mother out the projects. Yeah. Cause that's all he wanted to do. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was really, uh, a very small cog in that because he was the creative genius behind all of that. Mm. I just wanted to make sure that he was able to make, a living and doing what he loved to do.
That's amazing, man. True support, pure love, man. Love that. I think there's a something in that where you think uh, of how many amazing names worked on that album. Obviously, everyone knows about it. But for you doing the line budget, getting everything set, of all them amazing names, were they all like pretty much on time? Everyone was kind of delivering straight away, or were, were like was Primo taking a bit longer? Was Pete Rock taking a bit longer? Do you remember any of that? Was it all like bad? no? I mean, it was really I, the the only the only challenge I had was I had a small challenge with Pete Rock's brother, who was his manager at the time, mm. Ruddy. Mm. We had a we had a small um, bump just based on timing, mm. um, but for the most part, everybody did what they were supposed to do. Amazing, you know. It was just it was it was extremely. Easy. And again, yeah. in all fairness, I, I had great partners in Faith Newman. I had great partners in Columbia. Yeah. Um, you know, we had, we had, a, it was a great team of people around us from his product managers to yeah. the promotion department, the art department, you know, everyone just, it was such a, an amazing uh, group of young men and women who uh, worked on that project and, and saw it to mm. fruition. How, how does it how does it feel seeing Nas get that Grammy? Ah, uh, just so you know, so well deserved. I mean, King's Disease is such a great record anyway, but it's just so well deserved. It's 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 one of those things. It's funny, and I'm sure there's purists who feel this way. The first time a hip hop album was up for album of the year, mm. the record that won was uh, Steely Dan. Right. And it was an album no one heard. And they won the record and they all got up and they looked shocked for winning it. Mm. And I remember talking to a friend of mine and they were like, yeah, that's for 20 years of being in the business and never getting a Grammy nomination. Mm. They had to finally, you know, give them their flowers. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I remember, you know, hearing all the other albums there that Nas was up against. And I just remember saying to a friend of mine saying, yeah, he's going to win. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's, he's going to win. Mm. and um you know all those other albums had done significantly more, more numbers and but it was just it was his time it was his turn it was yeah. just his time mm. and um it was that king's disease grammy is for all of the albums that came before that yeah definitely man yeah loved that though it's just so nice to see um i just wanted to move on into like it's a 90s hip-hop podcast, so we talk about a lot about 90s. I just want to know, have you still got your check from Woodstock 99? I do. You I do. do? Wow. I do. It's, in a, it's actually in a box here somewhere. I just saw it because <laughs> my wife and I are remodeling a, a house we're getting ready to move into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at $333. Wow. Tell that $333. story for me. Tell me that story. No, and so, yeah, so, so um, our booking agent at the time... I had really been pushing to get us on Woodstock. Like I was like, why are we not on fucking Woodstock? Mm -hmm. And uh, at the very last minute, I think like, so Woodstock was Friday. Mm. We got a call on like Tuesday. Like, all right, I got you on Woodstock for a thousand dollars. Right. Like, Great. Like, fuck yeah. Like, yes. Awesome. Yeah. Mm. They're like, it's Friday. You don't have a hotel. They're not putting you up. Mm. You know, you're going to fly in, you're going to fly out. And we, we were living in New York, so what do we care? You know, yeah, yeah. Drive up, we'll drive home. Mm -hmm. Who cares? Mm. We got into our dressing room that had nothing in it. It was literally a mobile home right. that was being held for, like, I think, the Chili Peppers. But because the Chili Peppers weren't arriving for another two days, mm. we got to sit in this unair conditioned box. <laughs> right. And we're like one of the first bands to perform Friday at, I think it was noon. Oof. Right? Yeah. And we're not even on the main stage, mind you. Right. The main stage is like, I think it might have been a mile in the other direction. Oof. Who knows? Yeah. I don't, I don't even know. Yeah. But the announcer goes, ladies and gentlemen, Woodstock is proud to present third base. Mm. And all of a sudden, my wife says, she goes, honey, you're not going to believe this. And a fucking <laughs> massive of people start running towards the stage. 
Like now, mind you, we had not performed live mm. in six years. Wow. Maybe seven. We had not done a live show together. Damn. We had already broken up. I had gone my thing and not only just my thing, I'd built Echo Unlimited. I was building mm. another company. Mm. I, you know, I had my promotion company. Like I had a million other things I was doing. Mm. But we started to think about putting together the you know unreleased third bass album for Ichabod's Cranium. Yeah. And starting to work on that. Yeah, yeah. So we're like, all right, let's get on the road. Let's start, you know, feeling this out. Mm. And these people just start rushing the stage. And we spent the first maybe 15 minutes right. playing just hit records. Right. Just clips. DJ Eclipse was out there. Yeah. Uh, and he was just playing jump around. He was playing Nas. He was playing Naughty by Nature, Hip Hop Hooray. We're just getting them warmed up. We're getting them warmed mm. up. We're taking them back. We're taking them back. We're taking them back. Mm. Take them all the way back to I Ain't No Joe. And then we come into third base. Mm. And the fucking crowd goes apeshit. And I just start going apeshit. <laughs> and I remember there was a guy on the fr in the front of the... the uh, there was a guy who had a camera on right. a trolley. Right. On a trolley. I just jumped on the camera to ride the trolley. So he's pulling me like this, and he can't shoot me. I just want to be on the fucking trolley because I think it's the dopest shit ever. Right. The crowd is going crazy, crazy. Mm. 35, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 people. It's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Jeez. crowd goes crazy. We get off the stage, and one of the Woodstock promoters says, we want you for the whole weekend. And we were like, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, but <laughs> you should have recognized who we were before we got here. Fuck you. No, 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 no. We'll find a place for you to stay. I'm like, where? The mm. floor? <laughs> Fuck you. Um, anyway, so yeah, so that yeah. so me and my wife, we we were like, my wife was right. She was like, We don't have a change of clothes, we don't have toothpaste. Yeah. What are they gonna buy us clothes? Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Fuck you. <laughs> You didn't know who we were before we got here. <laughs> and then Rolling Stone did a piece. Oh, third base opened up Woodstock yeah. and tore it down. And and it was great. I mean, it was it was just it was exactly where we needed to be. It was exactly what we needed it to be. Mm. And it was perfect. It was a perfect grand opening, grand closing. Love that. Yeah. And Love that. uh yeah, it was also the first time I'd ever seen titties live on stage. <laughs> but I, this girl flashed me and I said, hey, honey, look, titties. <laughs> I'd never seen a girl flash me on stage before. From the great. 80s onwards, nothing? My God, that's amazing. That's no, man. That's pretty we good. had Our shows were straight sword fights. Right. There was no, there was, there was, it was all dudes. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Anyway. I was actually going to go into uh, your album, Return of the Product, man, because you took talking earlier about your kids, maybe not like, you know, getting into hip hop, that record, my man is still banging. I could play that. I reckon now. And there's so many heavy beats on that. So just want to say what a record. So props on that. Thank you. Two, one, how, well, actually one, how do you feel on that, that album now? Just how do you feel on that? You know, the, tr the total complete truth of the matter is I haven't listened to that record. And I don't know how long. Wow. You should go back, man. It's good. No, no, no. I, I, you know what it is? It is that album is literally the best of times and worst of times for me. Right. Um, it was the best of times because I had just married my wife. Mm. It was the best of times because I felt a sense of freedom. Mm. Um, I had made a decision to, uh, follow my heart. Uh, and I also made a decision that wasn't based on money. It was based on the fact that the person that I needed to be with mm. was not Russell, not Lior, not fucking the band. The person I needed to be with was my wife, mm. um, who was not my wife at the time. She was my girl. Uh, but that's the person I was committed to. Mm. Um, and, uh, 
making that record, being in LA and making that record, the, at least the first half of it mm. was really cathartic in a lot of ways because I worked with Wolf and Epic. Um, I got to experience working in a studio with musicians and engineers that had a lot of range and mm. Kane even talks about it on the, uh, did I ever tell you the one about big daddy Kane podcast? Mm. You know, when you come from New York, you're really in studios with sampling heavy producers. Mm. You go to LA and everybody plays an instrument. Everybody's a fucking musician. It's, 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 mm. you know, so I'm at like, Dave Stewart from the Arrhythmics House Cathedral Studios in his backyard and like fucking what? listening to like Nirvana record that hasn't come out yet. And what? You know, like, yeah, I mean, it was, I mean, making Here It Comes. Um, so it was like this, you know, mm. and I was very much listening to Wolf, not Epic, but Wolf, because he was like, you know, you should make records called Hard But True. And you should, you know, you should really think about, you know, expanding your mind and also kind of bringing an audience into a more like visceral peaceful space and mm. you know that's kind of where LA was at that time and for all intent and purpose I was planning on moving to Los Angeles right after I went out there mm. and then an earthquake happened and I was like yeah fuck that I'm out of here <laughs> like you know yeah, any place that's going to rip my house in half and insurance is not going to cover it like fuck it go on of good <laughs> And then I went back to New York and I was so excited. And I sat with my man Reef and I sat with my man Maddie C. At, at, they were both at the source. This was before mm. Maddie discovered Biggie and mm. you know, Reef went to not only Atlantic, but you know, um, and I played them half the songs and they were like, yo, these shits are trash. Damn. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, I love these records. He's like, nah, these ain't it. They're like search, we know you. This this ain't it. Mm. And they took me to Brooklyn and they introduced me to Todd Ray. And T Ray started playing me some beats. And I'm like, oh yeah, this is home. Mm. This is where I need to be. But I incorporated what I learned from LA and brought in Anton Pushansky and I brought in Kevin Reynolds. Mm. And I was like, all right, let's not sample, let's use live instrumentation, but let's compress it, make it sound like samples, and yeah, let's yeah. play keys and you know got into this whole instrumentation thing where we're compressing a lot of sounds and music and mm. just got into different, you know, engineering styles that I took from and learned from. Mm. Um, but the point was like half of that album, I didn't want to put out. Wow. Like all the stuff I did with Wolf and Epic besides here it comes, I didn't want it on the album, social narcotics, like, mm. like, at least the original social card, you know, hard but true. Like I didn't mm. want none of that on the record. And I called them and I was like, yo, I'm, I'm just letting you know I'm not using it. And Epic was like, cool. Like he was my man. He was cool. Mm. He's like, you know, Wolf sued me. Wolf sued me. He's like, nah, you're going to pay me. Wow. I was like, nah, I'm not going to pay you. Those are demos. He's like, no, no, they're not demos. Like you're going to pay me. Right. And I was calling an Epic and I'm like, yo, Epic, tell your man to calm down. Get your wolves off me. Mm. and he didn't and i had to wind up using him um because if i didn't use him the record would have been more like back to the grill again and mm. hits the head and span slum and t-ray yeah. and mm. it would have been a much more east coast boom bap record wow um with a lot more live instrumentation mm. so it's very much the best of times and the worst of times um but that re I'm very proud of that record. Don't get me wrong. I'm very mm. proud of that record. Um, and uh, I loved the crew that I had around me. Sabak Red, who then went to nonfiction, was my mm. hype man. DJ Riz, DJ Eclipse were my DJs. You know, I was mm. going out with the whole, you know, yeah. crew. Uh, we did Glastonbury the first time Glastonbury wow. ever happened. I was I did Glastonbury. Flew my wife out to Manchester, Amazing. five months pregnant with our first daughter. Um, what? You know, so just had some yeah. amazing, you know, times. Um, but learned really quickly. And it's still true to this day. And, and mind you, I want to say this because I'm not looking for like the pity party. Mm. But I learned really quickly. People don't want to see an MC Search show. 
They mm. want to see a third base show. And that's okay. They're never going to get one. Mm. But I'm okay with that. Like, I'm okay with the fact that if they don't want to see me by myself, it's okay. Like, mm. I understand why. Um, I happen to be dope on stage by myself. But yeah, I understand why there would be such a, a want for the group. Yeah, yeah. I see. Because what you're saying there, though, but I mean, first of all, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I was actually going to say that when you hear something like Hits the Head, that track alone now, my first thoughts go to someone like M, Eminem. Like you think, my God, 1992, this is Eminem. This, I'm not saying just style wise, but the beat, the atmosphere. And then obviously M recently talked about the cactus, big, big up the cactus and stuff. How, how's that feel like to see an MC like M? get learn stuff from yourself and you know yeah I, you know it's you know I, look i when i went to detroit to do radio he was the first person i called mm. you know him and paul rosenberg and uh marshall's always been a really good human being in my life mm -hmm. you know he's always been a solid human being in my life yeah um the context that he gave us our props in was you know like it, it was unwarranted because he was he was talking about the fact that I had said that um, artists like G Easy and Mac Miller and Action Bronson are more influenced by the artists that they came up with than third base, which is, you know, we're just too old. Mm. And he was saying that, you know, it's bullshit to think that Eminem was solely, and that's how it was kind of being made to sound. Mm. Because if you listen to his Grammy speech, he thanks Kane, G Rap, Naughty, like mm. thanks 10 other artists. He, do, he doesn't ever mention third base. He mm. mentions the 10 artists. And I'm that's fine. Like that's exactly the point I was trying to make to the person who was interviewing me at the time. Right, right, right. You know, it's not, it doesn't have to be white on white rhyme. Like it doesn't have to be like, oh, I'm, you know, third base came before me. So I'm automatically, yeah, yeah. you know, inspired by third base. No, because I'm inspired by fucking Kane yeah. and G-Rap. Like, it's not about Rakim. Yeah. Rakim's my favorite MC of all time, like, period. Mm. End of conversation. I Ain't No Joke is the most perfect rap record ever made. Yeah. Period. Doesn't matter what comes in before, during, after. Mm -hmm. For me, that is the perfect rap record. Yeah. From the first beat to the end. It's perfect. So all I was saying was it's, it's really silly. Mm -hmm. It's silly and it's simplistic to think that because M's white and I'm white, we must have been, there must have been. And I love that he proved that there were lyrics that he remembered that were album cut lyrics. Mm -hmm. Like he pulled album cut lyrics to recite yeah. that he was saying that, that were influential mm -hmm. of my wordplay and my word flow. But my point was that it's not just us. Yeah. It's Kane. It's G Rap. Kane is is Eminem's favorite MC of all time. Yeah, yeah. So that's the the only point I was making. Yeah. Other than that, you know, it's always a wonderful thing. It's humbling to hear artists talk about how your music, how your wordplay influenced them. It's always mm -hmm. it's always a beautiful thing. Yeah, absolutely. Man, wicked. Um so search man we've gone so many different places i've just been here along for the ride man it's been brilliant i should have got some popcorn i should have just been like you know this is pretty amazing all these stories i wanted to just kind of wrap it up though you've done so much like in the music game in behind the scenes timeless podcast company you're doing stuff like that now i'd love for you to break that down for us listeners here as well now like what are you what are your next aims goals you know what would you like to do now yeah, I think, you know, our number one focus is Timeless Podcast Company, which is basically, you know, I, I not only want to give the podcast game uh, and a way for our storytellers to tell our stories, but I want it to be with the respect it, it deserves. And uh, so I spent about a year and a half meeting with different uh, headphone companies, different sound companies to understand what immersive sound design would sound like in a podcast. Right. Um, because I wanted it to be the theater of the mind. I wanted it to really go into the deeper, darker areas of sound design. Mm. 
So we were able to create literally 5.1 and 5.2 surround sound, sound design for our podcasts. So when you listen to the Did Ava Tell You the One About Big Daddy Kane, mm. you're hearing the sound design and the environments of where he grew up. When he talks about going to you know, elementary school, we recorded at that elementary school. When he talks about going to Albee Square Mall, we had sound designers in Albee Square Mall. Amazing. We want you to understand what it sounds like. Um, and we did it in a way, you know, with, with a, an amazing sound design team, Brett Mazur and Sugar Studios and his studio in LA, where, you know, Dolby Atmos was able to really help us along the way in mm. creating this amazing uh, sound experiment and, and sound design. So every podcast we do is in immersive sound design. Um, so we have Breaking Anonymity coming up, which talks about addiction mm. and talks about breaking the stigma of a 12-step program, talking to influencers, talking to celebrities, talking to athletes, talking to artists who have broken the chain of addiction, how they did it, um, and doing that in sound design. Um, you know, we have season two of Did I Ever Tell You the One About podcast? Did I Ever Tell You the One About MF Doom? Mm. Um, so that's coming um, in October on the first anniversary of, of his death. Wow. Um, amazing. We have, line, we have Line for Line, which is another an amazing one. And then we have Search Says, which is much more of a variety uh, podcast, not so much sound design, but really, you know, talking to Quest Love, talking to Chris Rock, talking to Method Man, talking to, yeah. you know, just talking to people about, you know, anything and everything. So we're getting ready to relaunch that in August as well with new guests, you know, a new production team behind it. Um, and also just kind of coming up with more and more and more ideas of how to create uh, immersive sound design around great storytelling. Yeah. Oh, man, it's amazing. So that's what the Timeless Podcast Company is. Yeah. For people out there, go check that Kane podcast, the Method Man chat. I just I finished up the other day that you had with the Method Man. What a wicked chat. So just laid back. He was like, yeah, brilliant. Just to hear your artists like that. So yeah, big up on creating these spaces. They can tell these stories, man, because I don't know, sometimes it feels like things can get lost a little bit. And, you know, even though, you know, we've had such a history of hip hop been documented, I feel there's so much more to come, right? So yes. yeah, absolutely beautiful, man. Agreed. But search... Thank you for your time, man. I appreciate all of it. Uh, before you go, what's the last great piece of music you heard? Could be old, could be new, just the last oh, piece. Yeah. Um, oh, man. Last piece of great music that I heard. It's a great question. Um, I think it was probably... If I had to, if I had to pick something, it would probably be uh, a band out of Brooklyn called Pom Pom Squad, Death of a Cheerleader. Okay, but, uh, that just an alt rock band out of Brooklyn called Pom Pom Squad. Right, Death of a Cheerleader. Okay. That's probably a, an amazing record. They're signed to a German label called City Slang. Um, but yeah, I think to me they're just they're an amazing alt rock band and uh, just. Love that band. Crying, probably their new single, Crying, is is just a fucking piece of art. Wow. Okay. I'm here for Smoke Rock. Definitely. Love that. Well, man, thank you so much. And yeah, just keep smashing it and keep bringing us all this amazing gold nuggets, man. We love it. We love it, man. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. No problem. Peace, bro.